So what is your full name, please? William P. Galbraith. Can you spell that for me? You need to spell William too? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> P. Galbraith, G-A-L-B-R-A-I-T-H. And actually it was William Henry Galbraith at one time. But when I, when I was confirmed, I took Patrick because I didn't like Henry. And uh, so I took that, my uh, look over me after the whole time I was in combat, you know. <laughs> and where and when were you born? I was born in Pasadena in January the 25th, 1924. So how old are you today? 94. I'll be 95 in January. And which branch of the military did you serve with? I served, I was only in the 506, 101st Division. Well, we weren't in the 101st Division until we went, got to Bragg, you know. I was, but I was in the 506 from the day I got in the service to, till I got wounded. And which unit in the 506 were you with? Which company did you serve? I with? Company. And headquarters third after Normandy. Great. And what years did you serve from and until? I uh, went in uh, September 19... 44, and uh, I got out in June 1947. I got went in the service in September, went overseas in September, and got hit in September, <laughs> my month. Might have kept me from getting killed. <laughs> and what rank did you attain? Well, I, I got up to T4 just before I got out, but then I got broke when I was late, coming back and late from uh, Normandy. I mean, from Holland, from Scotland, rather. In fact, that's quite a story. I loaded all my gear on this B-17, and they had given me a st statue of St. Patrick. But when the pilot said, I, you know, I couldn't fly because I didn't have a chute, I left all my gear on that plane. I was so mad I did, I forgot to even get the stuff out of my, out of the plane. So that plane ended up with that statue of St. Patrick in it. So to this day, I won't. I know they wouldn't have got rid of it. It'd be like an omen, you know. I just wondered did it get shot down on the ne next mission or get all the way through the war? <laughs> was he really a guardian or not? <laughs> Great. So I'd like to talk a little bit about your childhood and growing up in Pasadena. Um, can you tell me about your... your well, that was really history? interesting. You mean really true. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, we were going up Eaton's Canyon. They don't even let adults up in anymore. It's too dangerous, they say. But anyway, we were going up, in the, up there, me and Dick Dixon, in the third grade, clear above the falls, We'd go up a 50-foot uh, run ladder and swim the pool. Most people didn't go past that pool because they didn't want to swim in ice water. And we'd go swim the pool and go way up the canyon almost to Mount Wilson when we were just in, in the third grade. <laughs> Pretty adventurous. Yeah. Now, uh, who were your parents? What were their names? Well, my m mother was uh, Bernice McKee, and uh, my dad was Cecil Robert Galbraith. Shorty, he hated Cecil. <laughs> so that was that was his nickname, Shorty. Yeah. And what did your parents do for a living? Well, my my dad was a, a truck driver. And uh, my mother was a, a registered nurse and a chemist. Um, and did you have any siblings? One, but he died at, shortly after birth. Okay. 
So you grew up an only child. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned earlier that your parents had split up when you were pretty young. Nine. And so then I went with my mother everywhere she went, and I ended up in Long Beach. Uh, and, and did you continue a relationship with your father, or was that... Oh, the well, I seen him, you know. Yeah. I'd ride a bicycle all the way from Hollywood, when we lived in Hollywood. To, in fact, that's quite a story. My dad had given me a twenty two rifle when I lived in in Hollywood. And I, I come, I used to hunt up me in Canyon, me and Dick. And I was riding, I rode that bicycle with that 22 across the handlebars all the way from Hollywood to Pasadena. And I didn't get stopped till I got in Pasadena. So the cops asked me where I was going, and I said, well, I just told them I was going to my granddad's. So they put me in the bicycle and the rifle in the car, took me to my granddad's, and it was the first house south of Colorado on Allen Avenue. And uh, they said, they got to the door and they said, is this your grandson? <laughs> and he, my granddad, instead of saying yes, he, he says, what did he tell you? <laughs> and the cop says, he said, he said it was your grandson. He, well, it's my grandson, he's not a damn liar. <laughs> no, and then they asked me, is this, is this his rifle? And that's when my granddad said, what did he tell you? Yeah. So uh, when your parents had split up, did that have, uh, what type of effect did that have on you? Very big effect, yeah. It's, it's, it's a, I think it's a disaster on the kids when the, when the parents split up. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how, how that affected you? Well, uh, I... My mother was uh, uh, taking care of patients, and of course I had to go with her because I was I went with my mother when they split up, because she didn't have a family and my dad did. Her family had all died, and <clears throat> when one time we were staying with a man right on Lincoln Avenue, across from the Rose Bowl, and I was going to school clear the other side of. of, of uh, my, 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 of the canyon where the Rose Bowl is, I'd have to ride my bike clear the other side over there to Loma Linda, or Yorba Linda, rather, Yorba Linda. Loma Linda, something like that. And uh, <coughs> anyway, that was quite a ways for a kid to ride a bike. And my mother took me out of that school and put me in St. Andrew's Catholic School. And uh, that was closer. So anyway, I ended up having to ride a bicycle everywhere I went, you know. Uh, so growing up during the Great Depression, uh, were there any hardships that your, your family felt? Not really. My dad was never out of work. I mean, which was uh, maybe unusual, but he was never out of work. And my mother works even, you know, when the, while they were married, she were, took patients and would go and stay with people that were you know, if she had to nurse them, she'd go and nurse them where they were and stuff. She wasn't working at the hospital or anything like that. She worked out of home and stuff. So if she had to go stay with a patient, would you go with her? Or would oh, you well, after you? my folks split up, yes, yeah. yes. But before that, no. But she was always bringing clothes from the patients because they were rich most of the time, you know. So you were staying, were, were you staying in a lot of uh, different people's homes growing up? Were you moving from place to place? After I had folks split up, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah we stay, I stayed, I was, went with my mother wherever she went after they split up. Right, so after they split up, uh, did, did your mother, did you and your mother have a place of residence or was your place of residence wherever her patient? Lived? Most of the time it was where the patients were, but well, you know, one place in Pasadena, we had an apartment for a while. And then after, way later in Long Beach, we had apartments and stuff. 
And then she got remarried after we were. So you were frequently packing up and unpacking and moving from one house well, to the next. Yeah, yeah. Until we got, we're pretty permanent after we got to Long Beach. Okay. And uh, my mother remarried. And what and age were you uh, when you moved to Long Beach? 15, I suppose. I went to uh, Hamilton Junior High School when I first moved to Long Beach, mm -hmm. and I used to do a lot of, I was doing a lot of drawings for, and you, in uh, pastel. I did a whole bunch of ships of the War of 1812 when I was in, in I wasn't in art, I was, I was in the U.S. and G in history. And I had nine of them in the main, you know, where the halls come together in the, high, in the junior high school. Mm -hmm. I sold every single one of them to a teacher for $5 a piece. <laughs> that was a lot of money in them days. That's not bad. <laughs> they were all ships. So you liked, you liked the arts, you liked to paint, you liked yeah. to draw. Yeah. I know so you continued yeah. up, up until today still. Yeah. Now, did you have I, any in fact, I sold every damn one of the pictures to teachers. All right. Yeah. That's not a bad deal. Uh, aside from selling your artwork, did you have any other jobs as a, as a youth growing up? Well, I think the first job I got was uh, at Ralph's grocery store, hustling, gro uh, you know, groceries out to, you know, people's cars and stuff. But on... Uh, in the summer, I, I worked for the U.S. Forestry Service behind Mount Wilson mm -hmm. in the West Park of the San Gabriel. And uh, that was really, really one of the most interesting things I did. I was, I was working with two other guys and we were winding trails. So we were using dynamite and we would drill, drill in, we'd draw a pocket, then we'd put dynamite in and, 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 and to widen trails and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's all, all over behind uh, Mount Wilson. So that, that's why I think they knew that the war was coming really because we were widening the trails for pack animals. And how old were you at the time? Well, I was in high school. I guess I was about You're a teenager. 15, yeah. 16. You had a fifteen-year-old out there packing dynamite. Yeah. yeah. Um, In fact, we we made a, a point of if anyone was coming down the trail, I'd yell, "Leonard, throw me a stick of dynamite." <laughs> and you know, some of, most people think of if you drop the dynamite, it'd be a big explosion or something. You know. <laughs> so we always made sure we caught it. You know. Do you know about how much money you were making at the time? No, I have no idea. It's way too long. I remember trying to to uh, write back to the ranger in, in La Cañada, mm -hmm. and I had no idea how to spell La Cañada. So I tried to spell it like it sounds. I got a letter back. Spell the Canada, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I was trying to pronounce it, so I, I you know, tried to write it like it sounds. They have a, a Y in Yeah, there. a Y and everything. I got the letter back. So do you remember where you were uh, December 7th, 1941? Oh, I can't remember. I was at Long Beach, that's all. When Pearl Harbor I remember there. sitting in my, in my we, we lived on, uh, in, in uh, Belmont Shore at that time. Uh, and, uh, right now I can't think of the name of the road. But I, we, I lived in a, above a garage. It was a, so the second story in a sense. It was above a garage. And I was sitting up there with my 25, 35, waiting for the Japs. <laughs> What's a 25, 35? A Winchester rifle. Okay. That's the caliber, 25, 35. My dad had given it to me. 
So when you had heard that, that the U.S. had been attacked, um, do you remember what, what thoughts ran through your head? I know you said you were sitting there waiting for, for them to come. But, yeah. Um, you know, well, the country was at war now. I know you're, you're about to say Well, I, I ended up, uh, actually I was working for Zell's gas station on uh, Ocean and American Avenue, which is Long Beach Boulevard now. And uh, when when the war for either that or Hilton, I can't really remember because I I went from Ezell and started working for the Hilton Hotel. Mm -hmm. I really think I was working for the Hilton Hotel when the war started. Okay. It was on Ocean Avenue also. I remember the pilots coming in after they were coming back from some place, uh, and they were all flying sergeants. And those things, you know, before they had to be officers and stuff, you know. And, and they were coming, they were staying. I was running the, the freight elevator in the, in the hotel, and they would, instead of waiting for the main one, I would take them up to Sky Room and stuff, you know. Really impressed by, by all these guys. And they were flying P-38s because uh, we've seen them flying all, just barely above the water, you know, off of Long Beach here, past the hotel, you know. Now, you were still in high school at the time? Yeah. And did you eventually graduate? No, I quit school and joined the service. So you joined in 42, September 42? Yeah. And I got out in, in June 1947. And uh, you went down to the enlistment office? In Long Beach, yeah. And you wanted to be a paratrooper? Yeah. Right and right so but they told me I'd have to join the infantry. So can you tell me about that experience? And well, they uh, I, I wanted to join the paratroops, and uh, they said, you'll have, you have to join the infantry first, and then transfer into the paratroops. Well, let me ask you, how did you hear about the paratroopers to begin with? Well, the Germans at Crete. And so anyway, I heard you, the paratroops got $50 extra a month, and basically that's why I decided to go into the paratroops, extra 50 bucks. So they told you you had to join the infantry first. Yeah. <clears throat> so I joined the infantry, and I got to L.A. When after when I was supposed to report, they looked at my uh, enlistment, and they said, you enlisted for the infantry? Because no one, if you enlisted, you could get anything you wanted, Air Force or anything. And I said, no, I enlisted for the paratroopers. They told me I have to go in the infantry first. And they said, not anymore. <clears throat> and they put in red across my enlistment papers, paratroops go to the front of the line. And I was rushed right through and went to Fort MacArthur, got a uniform, shoved on a train, and went to Tokoa. So I was in the same company from the day I joined the Army till the day I got really in the Army until the day I got hit. So when did you arrive in, in Camp, Camp Tacoa? In, in September 1944. Um, you, said, you said 1944, but you also... Oh, 42. Okay, yeah, I just wanted yeah. to make sure, because you would have yeah, no, been in Europe. 42, 42. yeah. So it was. It happened quick. You you went enlisted, and then you were shipped out right or right, right straight out right, away. right straight to Tacoa. We were only in uh, MacArthur long enough to get a uniform, and shots and all that kind of stuff. They gave me. So when you, you and a haircut. <laughs> so when you first arrived at Tamp Camp Tacoa, what was your experience there? What was your initial? Impression? Well, we went into W Company. Uh, you had to go to W company, and then they assigned you a company from there. And so everybody 
that first one in Sequoia went to W Company. And then they assigned you to wherever they want. And it was more or less on your initials and stuff like that. They, they you know, call out your name and they put you in the company. That's just about the way it was. So I was in I Company from the day I got in the service and, and, and almost till I got hit, but I got, I transferred to headquarters company after Normandy because Captain Kiley, who was my company commander all the way through Normandy, <coughs> took, me to, <coughs> took me with him to S3 when we got back to in England. So can you tell me about your first few days and, and first few weeks at Camp Tacoa and, and your experience there going through training? Well, it was damn tough. They flunked out about, they kept about a third of us because uh, it, was, it was such rugged training. And the longest march we made was from when we f went to Benning, the 3rd Battalion march from Atlanta to the Alabama section of Benning, which was 150 miles. In what period of time? I really don't. It was, we broke a record, whatever it was, but I don't know. I don't really know. I think two or three days. It's a lot of walking. Oh, it sure was, yeah. And that's uh, full, full packs and everything? Yeah. In fact, it's kind of funny. I was uh, snuck my uh, gas mask into my luggage. We didn't have to pack, you know, uh, luggage and stuff like that. And I put, I snuck the gas mask into it, and, and shuttle caught me. And I had to carry two rifles the whole last day on the way into Benning. That was that was your. So pleasure. if you look on any of those pictures and see someone with two rifles, it's me. <laughs> And that's a punishment. You cannot move one. Usually you can move your rifle back and forth. You got two of them, you're stuck. You got no, no relief on either. No side. relief. And did you, did you make any close friends? Oh, I sure did. Oh, sure. Every, every one of us. That band of brothers is not just, it's, it's not just a statement. We were. It's not exclusive yeah. to, to, to one company. Or yeah, the Browns, uh, uh, I have an album in there you, I can show you later. But uh, I was closer to the Browns than anybody else, really. They, uh, me and Jim Brown was on the same gun, and me and Jim looked alike. We looked more like, more like brothers than Jack, which was his twin. And it was really odd that that was the way it was, you know. And one of our lieutenants used to always call me Brown because they thought we were the brothers, you know. So you had twin brothers in your unit? No, Jim did. Right, but I mean, they were... They twin were brothers, twins. yeah, Jim and Jack were twin brothers. But Jim was on the, on the machine gun with me, and Jack was a rifleman. So when we were in Normandy, and we, they got split up. Uh, Jack had the, our squad went in to protect the uh, Pathfinders, mm -hmm. but they didn't take the crew serve weapons. So Jack was part of the ones, uh, there was seven riflemen that went in to protect the uh, Pathfinders. But only three of them got back to us. Edwards and Weber and, and McMillan, and Jack was captured. about uh, Mount Curahee when... Well, yeah, it was a three-mile mountain we ran up and down, usually just once a day. Mm -hmm. Not every day even, I don't think. But if they got pissed off, it's just something they'd run you up again just for punishment or something, you know. And did you fare pretty well running up and down that, that mountain? I had to point for the forestry service, and I was one of them that didn't bother a damn bit. So you were used to it. Yeah. And then, um, when did you start your jump training? In uh, December 
42. And I, I uh, my last jump was uh, on uh, January the 2nd, 1943. So how did that, how did that start? Take me through that, that process, your jump training. You guys started in, in towers? I understand. Well, we, yeah, and Benning, once we got to Benning, okay. we had them in, in uh, Tacoa also, we had those towers. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but uh, there were 35 foot towers. Uh -huh. And then when we got to Benning, they had the big tall towers, 250 foot towers. But uh, that was all just routine. Uh, There's one kind of a good story that I, I got to kick out of. Uh, one of my best friends after the war, and during the war, uh, was uh, <clears throat> was Gall. His name is Lenny, because we called him Sam all during the war, when I was in the service. And <clears throat> one of the instructors at Benny's was chewing him out for spinning the, in the sawdust or doing some damn thing, you know, giving him, you know, chewing him out. And this guy, it always embarrassed me because this jackass was from Pasadena, and I'm from Pasadena. But his name was Henry H. Henry. And he interrupts this sergeant and says, excuse me, sergeant, I am acting Sergeant Henry H. Henry. And if there's anything that I can do to assist you, feel free to call on me. Now, these sergeants could tell a colonel to pick up spit. And the sergeant says, oh, thank you, acting sergeant Henry H. Henry. You can start out by giving me 50 push-ups. So and then, he said, then he went back to chewing good gall out some more. Turned after a while, he says, acting sergeant Henry H. Henry, did you do those? 50 push-ups? He says, yes, Sergeant. He says, now get down and give me 50 more for not cheating when you had a chance. And they rode him from then on, all the way, you know, in, in Benny. He had a bullseye on him. For making back. such an ass of him. So. <laughs> and he gave Pasadena a bad name. Yeah. <laughs> so he did for me. <laughs> So eventually, after you made your uh, your practice jumps, um, I understand you did, you had to do a few daytime jumps and then a few nighttime jumps. Yeah, we made, no, we only made one nighttime jump. Okay. And <clears throat> it was kind of a a bad experience for one of one of our guys. I think it was a, a, an officer, but I don't remember who it was because he won our battalion. But uh, it was a nighttime jump and the the, and there was a runway, and, and the, it was, the water on the runway looked like a river, you know, a reflection. And it, the poor devil got in fast and uh, harnessed and dropped uh, onto the roadway, thinking he was landing in a Chattahoochee. But I landed in, in where it was wet. And, <clears throat> and uh, so when I got in, I to hurry to pack up my chute, you know. I wanted to, I wanted to make sure I, if you got another chute, you had to wait in line and all this kind of stuff. And so I, I wanted to pack the chute and go with the people I knew. I didn't want to jump with somebody I didn't know and have them freezing the door in front of me or some damn thing. So anyway, I got it all packed. <clears throat> and the instructor, when, he was, when we started to get in the plane, he felt the harness and it was wet. And he says, is that chute wet? I says, no. He says, well, if it's wet, it won't open. So I was really thinking about that on the way, <laughs> before the mighty thankful opening shot that time, I'll tell you for sure. He jumped anyways. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you never had any hesitation to jump out of? No, out of most every... We only, only man we had failed failed on the towers, on the 35-foot towers, believe it or not. They were harder for some people to jump out of than the airplane. So 
So if you had made it past those towers, you were just about made it. Yeah. And then once you once you uh, completed all your uh, practice jumps, and you received your your jump wings. Oh yeah. How did you How did you feel once you got got that? You know, like a million dollars. Yeah. To carry your your head a little higher. Damn right. Yeah. We were really proud to win that. Get those wings. I'll tell you for sure. And then eventually, uh, you were sent overseas. Yeah, when, when, uh, on the Samaria, the, his, his Majesty's ship, Samaria. We, we went up to Camp Shanks, uh, you know, uh, in New York, mm -hmm. and then shipped out of New York on the Samaria. And when did you find out that you were going to be headed to Europe and not, not the Pacific? Well, we were. <laughs> when we got in New York, we didn't think we were going to the Pacific. Of course, no one tells you anything, you know. And we 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 landed in Liverpool. I think about ten days later. I think it took us about ten days to cross the Atlantic. I'm not sure though. And anything memorable about that experience crossing the the Atlantic? Oh, it just seemed to, the waves looked a damn sight bigger than we expected. A couple of submarine scares and stuff like that. And I remember when we finally got <coughs> off the coast of Ireland, <coughs> uh, we had the Spitfires come out to meet us and we knew damn well we were safe from submarines then, you know. They, they escorted you in the rest of the way. For the rest of the way, yeah. And, and that was up the channel between Ireland and, you know, toward uh, Liverpool. And do you remember about what what month you arrived in England? September. You arrived in September. I think when I joined the army in September, went overseas in September, got hit in September. That's how I remember. So uh, it would be September of '43 that you arrived in yeah. in England. Um, went straight to Ramsbury. So what were you doing for the, the next few months? Um, training, training, training. Do you have any fun? <laughs> Not really. Not really. I never got to really meet many people or nothing, you know. Um, I didn't have a girlfriend in England or anything like that at that time. I didn't have it ever. Not, you know, I never had a girlfriend in England or anything. And you were shot, uh, assigned to the machine gun squad? Well, I was, went through that uh, before we went over. So you had training? Before, before overseas. In fact, I always thought it was a little stupid. What was? Yeah, they trained you on it for the machine gun on a thousand inch range, shooting at one inch squares. And it's all click, 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 the little deal on, the, you know, on your tripod. We got into combat, we didn't keep any of that crap, never used it, ever. So I thought it was kind of stupid. You never used uh, what, exactly? The, the uh, dial system on the machine gun, you know. For zeroing like to, in. Yeah, the you had to dial it all these, these little in squares and all this crap, and. So you just set up and. Yeah, we just set it up and shot it free. We didn't have any messing around with that damn crap. In fact, we never had that thing on the on the machine gun at any time. In fact, in Normandy, we lost the goddamn leg packs and never. I jumped the machine gun all through training. You know, I hooked onto my harness right here, and before we went into Normandy, they made us put them in them damn leg packs, and everybody, we almost everybody lost the damn leg pack. And that was something that was was new, was newly introduced. Yeah, we never before. we'd never jump with a leg back. That was a, a last minute. But as I'm being shot though, the planes didn't slow down enough, I don't guess, or something. Almost everybody lost a leg pack and they packed every all their you know, goodies and stuff like that in a leg pack, some of them, you know. But others kept it in their, you know, pack and the harness and behind it and stuff like that. But, 
So there was a was there a team of you that were uh, operating the machine gun? You had ammo. Carriers? Well, there was uh, the gunner assistant guy was assistant. Jim was gunner. I was assistant gunner. And we had an ammunition carrier. But Young broke both ankles when he jumped to Normandy. We never seen him at any time. So we. Jim and I were stuck with the gun and all carrying the gun, ammunition, and everything, and all, just between the two of us. And as the, as the assistant gunner, what is your responsibility? <laughs> just take it over for Jim or carrying the ammunition and stuff like this. So you guys would trade on and off? Oh, sure. Okay. In fact, I got stuck with it in uh, Normandy. <clears throat> The uh, Nye come up to us and said that uh, Penner had been wounded and wanted to volunteer to go help Penner. And the stupid ass Jim volunteered to help Penner, leaving me with a gun, ammunition, tripod, and the whole goddamn thing to carry it and move around and everything on the way. Yeah, that was in Bloody Gully. And uh, it was. A stupid move for a lieutenant to make, but taking one, only two guys on the gun to begin with, then take one away for some damn reason. Yeah, you guys were already down a man. Yeah, and them damn guns are heavy. How 33 much, pounds. Weight? Just for the gun? Yeah. Plus ammo and everything else. Plus ammo and that tripod. So I guess it was close to 50. <laughs> I don't know for sure, but. you talk to me about the days, the weeks and the days leading up to you jumping into Normandy? Did things start? Well, we were trading almost every, every, almost every day, night and day. And <coughs> they had night jumps and stuff like We made the Churchill jump in uh, England. And uh, in fact, I was uh, on a, a shoot detail laying the shoots out before the jump. And we were, there was a, one of our American P-51s sitting on a tar, you know, and uh, the wind clipped the wings. They'd clip the wings like a, like a Spitfire. And, no, uh, <clears throat> well, I think it was, a, it, was, it was a Spitfire with the clip wings. And <clears throat> anyway, it took off. And we made a complete loop, and just if it had the wheels down, it would have landed. Two, twice it did that, and then flew off and stuff. And when it come back and landed, went taxied up to the very same place, you know. It had American markings on it though, and everything. So we thought, boy, we expect someone to get out of there looking like Flash Gordon, you know. Took the helmet off. It was a girl. Long hair. We were really, really surprised. <laughs> you weren't expecting that. No, it sure was. I wasn't expecting this girl to be flying it. But it had American markings. We expected somebody to get out of there looking like Flash Gordon. Mm -hmm. So, let's see. So, the initial invasion was supposed to happen the the day prior yeah but it got it got postponed yeah um, in fact some of the prisoners we captured asked us why we were late is that right the german six had been sitting there for three days waiting on us they knew you were coming they brought them out of russia in may that's how much they knew ahead of time where we were going to be <clears throat> i got a book on the german six and <clears throat> So they were sitting there waiting for us for three days. They went in as a unit like we did, and they didn't. They left every man for yourself. At least we left as a unit. There was only 30, 34 of us left, 27 enlisted men and four, four officers. And we went all the way through Normandy, not even a platoon. So um, the first night, because like I said, it, well, it, I, the first day I, I landed at night, you know, on the jump. But before you even jumped, when you guys are getting ready that first night, when when 
uh, you know, the invasion is on. Um, you guys are, I'm assuming. Did it was you daylight, even, actually. Did, did you even board your, your C-47 or how far along did you get until they told you it was called off or postponed? Oh, we never got on the planes the first day. Okay. We were, we got all our ammunition, everything, everything was issued to us and everything. But then they postponed it, yeah. And then <clears throat> Wolverton, I think this is pretty important. On the day before we jumped, he says, I want you to join me in a prayer for the success of our mission. I want you to kneel down and look up, not down. And he says, God Almighty, in a few short hours, we'll be in battle with the enemy. We do not join battle afraid, ask for favors or indulgence. We only ask if you use us as your instrument for freedom of the, for the freedom of the world. Well, <clears throat> we do not ask uh, what our fate might be. We only ask that if die we must, we'll die as men would die without pleading or begging, safe in the feelings with, that we have done our best for what we believe is right. Watch over our lovers and with us now as we pray to you, move out. Now, I think that was one of the nicest things before anybody went. Uh, Colonel Johnson, I understand, stood out before everybody with a knife or something, and he was going to stick it in the first germ that he'd seen and all this kind of crap. And I thought, I, I fought with the 501 for the first three days, and I thought he was a jackass. <laughs> I'm on, on the, when we landed, I, it was at night, and the only one I met was our first sergeant, and uh, he, had, he had broke his ankle. Paul Garrison was his name. And uh, so I stuck with him, helping him, you know. And we joined a big group of people, you know, that was also with us. And yet, this is at night. You can't, you know, identify much. But I think these people were the 501, part of the 501. And so, but. Garrison couldn't, uh, couldn't keep up because of his broken ankle. And we had just got to the edge of the, past the hedgerow to this big open field. And of course, they were ahead of us. And the flare went up. And the machine gun opened up on, on all those guys ahead of us. And of course, they all hit the deck as soon as we, So you have no idea how many was hit or anything like that. But uh, so we had to stand perfectly still while that flare, until that flare went out. Because they always taught us if we got caught in a flare, don't move. Because that catches your attention or something, you know. So we had to stand there in that bright light, wondering if that machine gunner could see us too, you know. But anyway, we were safe. It's pretty terrifying. Man. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to rewind a little bit, um, and I'd like you to take me through the process of uh, you know, putting all, all your uh, equipment on and, and getting uh, all your stuff together, boarding the C-47. Um, well, yeah, we, once we had to have the machine gunners and stuff, mortarmen and stuff like that that had so much extra weight to carry had to have someone help get in the plane. You couldn't get in the plane by yourself. How much weight would you say you, you had on you? I would say close to 100 pounds. Yeah, yeah, you carry two or three extra. I think we had two, uh, the gun plus two boxes of ammunition. And, uh, yeah, but we, this is the first time we ever jumped these uh, leg packs. I, and I had jumped a machine gun the whole time in training, never had any problems with it at all. But we jumped to Normandy, the leg packs tore loose, and we lost everything that we put in. What did you have in your leg pack? Well, I didn't put it in. Uh, uh, Normandy was the first time that Jim, Gun Jim jumped the gun. 
Yeah. He thought because he was gunner, he should jump it in Normandy. And uh, so I really don't know if he lost his leg back or not. But I believe he did. Because I don't think we got a machine gun until after. In fact, I didn't get with a, with the uh, with my outfit for the three days. I was with the 501 for the first three days. And they gave me a machine gun because I was carrying ammunition. And uh, so I, I, I was out one night with them and, and uh, some, quite a group of people were moving in toward us. And uh, so we had so many of our own people scattered around trying to get to, you know, to their outfits and everything. So when I challenged them and they didn't answer the first time, I, I challenged them again to make sure, you know, that I wasn't shooting our own people. And so when they all hit the ground when I challenged them the second time. So I knew they were German. <clears throat> So I opened up a few rounds of the machine gun and won't come in. And he had something in his hand. And I kept telling him to drop the damn thing, you know, or I'd kill him. And every time he didn't know, didn't speak English or something, didn't know what the hell I was talking maybe. But anyway, an officer finally told him, told me not to shoot him, let him come in. So later, about, 10 or 15 years after the war, I met, I met a guy from the 501 and mentioned that happening. And he says, you know what he had in his hand? I says, hell no, I couldn't leave the machine gun. He says, his helmet. I said, how in the hell would you know? He says, I was a medic to fix him up. Now that's a really coincidence. 10 or 15 years after the war, I find a medic that, that fixed this German up. And he says the bullet hit right in the middle of his helmet and went up right up and took just top of his, you know, just skinned over the top of his head. So he probably didn't even know he had anything in his hand. You know what I mean? But anyway, he lived. So when you say you challenged him, you mean with the, the crickets that you guys would carry? We all used them at first. Is that, is that but what the Germans doing? got to use them too, so we quit. <laughs> you guys only use those in Normandy? Yeah. We never heard of them before. Or after? It was supposed to be an identification thing, which we didn't need. And the Germans had it, didn't take them. The night wasn't even over before they, you know, they knew everybody was using them. So, when you're when you're getting ready to board the C-47, are you, are you doing anything to, to psych yourself up? Um, Not really. I think we were all psyched up way before that, you know. We, we could hardly wait for it to happen. So the, yeah. the adrenaline's flowing. And yeah, yeah, we were all right ready to go. Really. We figured we were well trained, mm -hmm. had as good a chance as any. And it turned out we must have been damn well trained because the, the German Six was the most who, who our adversaries had been the whole time we were in Normandy. Or in Crete and all through in Russia and everything else was really, really, you know, combat uh, experienced forces. And we did well against them, so. So tell me about uh, once, once your plane takes off and you guys are flying across the channel, uh, and then once. Well, we were the only but, but group that flew out of Exeter. That's at the very southern tip of England. And so I can't tell you what other people saw, but, but uh, there wasn't, I, we, we got shot at when we crossed the down, uh, past that Isle of Man or whatever the hell, there was some island we passed. But uh, then it was, uh, went through a fog, unfortunately, just before we went to Normandy, got, flew into Normandy. And which really screwed up the formations and stuff like that. But uh, I think the biggest percent of the time the, the planes were not slowing down enough because it, they run into just one hell of a lot of, you could walk down on the tracers. 
There was so much being shot of. I couldn't get over how many different color tracers there was. <laughs> it really amazed me. You know, I wasn't expecting, expecting anything like that. But uh, <clears throat> as it was, they got three of our planes. And they were in pretty bad shape. But like I say, I didn't get with, a, with my own company for after three days. When I left the uh, 501, they had, I seen them bomb the bridges on the Dove where I was supposed to be. So I went to this lieutenant of the 501 and I says, I'm leaving <clears throat> for my outfit. They're obviously in trouble or they wouldn't have had to bomb them bridges. I would see the P-51s bomb them. And this lieutenant says, Get back on that gun or I'll have you shot for the desertion of the face of the enemy. I says, which way is the goddamned enemy? Walked away and left him standing there. <laughs> Me and Hove both. <laughs> I, I met Hove when, I, when we were getting uh, garrison to the 501. He was a, happened to be with them and then we, I said he was my machine gunner. Had, uh, had, you know, had a helper, you know. And so they put us, me and Hope, together on that machine gun while I was with the 501. So did you, uh, did you land in your drop zone, or were you guys thrown off? Very, I landed very, very close to where I was supposed to land. I landed uh, just north of the locks, right just south of Carentan and... and South of the logs, rather. I just landed south of the logs, yeah, because England is north, you know, from there. So I was just south of the logs, between Saint Comedy Mountain and the logs. What was your objective once you guys landed? In the bri the bridges on the Dove. Our, our, that's why we jumped in that particular area, where the first and second battalions jumped by the causeways. It was their job to clear the causeways for the 4th Division coming in. But it was our job to take those those bridges on the Dove. And do you remember which uh, which number in line you were to jump out of out of the plane? Not really, because uh, it switched. Uh, so we ordinarily did. But my, my uh, position in the line was generally about third. Uh, there was always a lieutenant that jumped us, and then it was Jim and then me. Um, and you mentioned there were three planes uh, that were lost. Oh, I have no idea. That I mean, out of your group. Yeah, the, the, <coughs> we lost uh, the whole first battalion, I mean, the whole, the whole, practically the whole first battalion, part of the third. And nobody made it out of those planes? There was, Were they shot down before any? Uh, four left? guys got out of one of the planes, uh, right by uh, uh, the cliffs. Uh, Sam Goodgall was one of them. He went in with the Rangers. He landed in the, in the channel and uh, went in with the Rangers. And. Uh, Lieutenant Johnson got back to us, and uh, Christensen was captured, and Goodgall finally got back to us. I have all those plans. Uh, and, and once you jumped out of the plane, you mentioned seeing all the tracers, and you said you could felt like you could have walked down on them. There were there were so many. No. Yeah. Um, was there anything else that? you saw that stands out in your memory? Not really. <laughs> the first, <clears throat> like I say, I no more got out of my harness and I held uh, Garrison out of his. And, uh, <clears throat> and then I seen a equipment bundle because when we lost the leg pack and I bent over to get, it was an ammunition you could tell by the color of the shoe. And even at night you can tell the you know, whether it's red or yellow, you know. So, so anyway, 
I, I, I bent over to get more ammunition because I figured we needed one when we got to where we were going. And a bullet come so close to me that I could feel it come by when I reached over to get the ammunition. So that was their first chance to get me, and they missed. And after we uh, we got back into the hedgerow in the morning, <clears throat> Gerson told me to go look and find out if there was anybody, any friendlies in our hedgerow because we're literally in the German lines. And I got down the edge of the hedgerow and there was a lieutenant there with a big, big radio. And he, he had the radio to our cruiser that was supposed to, uh, you know, give us naval support. And <coughs> he had somebody with him that was, and the bullet had hit the uh, M1 clip and went, then went through his shoulder, so he wasn't too badly hurt. But that was the first wound I actually seen. And so anyway, <clears throat> I told him that Garrison was afraid of it. With all the, that we were in, literally in the German lines, and uh, that the people out in the fields that we could see were taking so much fire and stuff, we were afraid that somebody would make call I mean, you know, a naval fire in on us and so he said, and that's when he said, well, you don't have to worry about that, I have that, you know. So I got back and told Garrison what he said, and he says, screw him. <laughs> so I had to, he gave me all the maps and stuff <clears throat> that he was carrying and told me to try to make contact with all the, there were about a thousand yards across the field. So I took off with the two boxes of ammunition and all his maps and shit. And some crowd was, started firing at me the whole time I was going. I could feel them come by, they were that close. And I finally dove in a little indentation <clears throat> and was laying there and they were skipping bullets off one side and then the other side. And I decided I only needed one box. <laughs> ammunition was gonna, so I got up and ran the rest of the way with it, you know. So I no one met all the troops over there and, and Hove was with the 501. So I had talked Hove into going back to get Garrison with me. And <clears throat> we got back to the edge of the woods, and, you know, and here come Garrison across that damn field. Could barely walk, right? No one so much as even took a shot at him. And they shot at me all the way running like crazy across the damn field. But I guess the damn Germans are soft hearted or something because they just let him get all the way across, no problem at all. He was a bit hobbled to begin with. Well, yeah, he couldn't hardly walk because he got a broken ankle, you know. A... So he'd been a very easy target. Then. Yeah, oh hell, they didn't have any problem if they wanted to shoot him. But he, he come across no problem. And we, of course, we left him with the 501 medics. And I've never seen him again at the time we were in arms. Now, did you have any other uh, weapons on you? Yeah, we, had, we had a carbine in, in a, in a uh, holster on our belt. So when we lost the leg pack, we didn't lose our weapon or anything. That was one good thing about that, you know. Yeah, you weren't without. And of course, a lot of, most, very few of the guys put their weapon in their leg pack anyway. Even the ones who was carrying a rifle or Tommy gun or something like that, they managed to put it close to their harness and most of them, they were supposed to take it apart and put it inside of a case, you know. There was a number for that case, but I forget what it was. You were supposed to take your rifle apart and put it in that case. Well, most of the guys that, with us, they didn't want to take the damn rifle apart didn't want to be putting it back together when they got to combat. So they figured a way to jump it with their, you know, with the harness and shoot. And you were in, in combat for a little over a month after you had jumped into Normandy, Normandy. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, the name Bloody Gully. No, that was just west of Carantan. And uh, they found out 
somehow that the SS was trying going to try to take Carantan back because Carantan was a, a hub that the Germans wanted. And so they had us attack first. We were the only ones available close enough, you know, to uh, stop them at the time. So we went into that attack with only seven, seven riflemen and two machine gunners in the whole damn company. <laughs> and how did it get it, its name, Bloody Gully? Oh, I guess Good Gall claimed it. Uh, he was hit in Bloody Gully, and they got him back to the medics, and they asked him for something, and he just says, well, I was hit back in that damn Bloody Gully, and that didn't. That's, that's where it came from. It wasn't really a gully, it was a, uh, a wagon trail between heads, uh, kind of between the fields and hedgerows. And uh, it may have been depressed a couple of feet is all. So it really wasn't a gully at all. It was just uh, a wagon track, really. Yeah. How it got named was just what well, good, good Gaul had called it. And I guess it went from there. Are there any other experiences that stick out in your memory uh, from your time in Normandy? Oh, not really. I think uh, the, the, the biggest uh, thing we run in. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> they, uh, we got, hadn't got back from the, joined up just after the bridges and we were in St. Condé Mont. And they had the, our squad, there was only five of us there, and they had our squad, there was three of us, three of them that got back to us that had been with the path, uh, wanted to protect the pathfinders. And so they asked us to patrol and look for Germans who had come back into our lines in our uniforms and to uh, question everybody, you know, and use a lot of W's because the Germans can't say that. They use all V, you know. So anyway, that's what we were doing. And <clears throat> we got to where everybody had been, in, right where they jumped and everything. And Kenfield was there, had been shot right between the eyes. So uh, we didn't try to pack him. We, he wasn't very well liked, unfortunately. So we didn't try to pack him in or nothing. We just you know, took his dog cat and, and reported where he was, where he was and everything. And uh, so we had, you know, three of the guys that had jumped there. And we, so that's how they knew right where to go and the whole shot where they were. And it was completely surrounded with dug in machine gun positions. How any of them ever got out of there alive, I have no idea. But the cats, you know, no, um, Zabrowski was the only one I know that was killed. The rest of them uh, was captured, you know, or got, got away. So it was a miracle the three got back to us, really, I think. But uh, anyway, on the way back, some Frenchman offered us a bottle of wine. And uh, so we hung on to it till we got back. And I said, what do you got? Uh, oh, nothing, sir. Oh, come on. So we let him open it and take a few drinks, and he didn't die, so we think it was okay. <laughs> no, he wasn't very well liked. I got to tell you a story about him, and this was really something. I was in, <clears throat> I had went on past the ready and uh, got back late or something, so our captain was with the British. We used to trade officers and listen men with the British for the experience, you know. And uh, so we had a British captain. And so at any rate, I, I think Kylie gave me a, a couple of weeks, uh, you know, restriction or something like, I forget how the length of time. But I got a restriction for being late. And now he says, added, he's going to add to this restriction. I had to wake him up for no, 
uh, Reveille every morning of that restriction. He's at least a couple of miles out of Ramsbury, staying at, I can't remember the name of the place. I've got it in my scrapbook, but I can't, can't remember. But I used to have to, they used to wake me up an hour ahead of everybody else and borrow Swedes Rosal's bike and ride out and wake that make, uh, nigh up for Reveille. So that one was going along for a while. And one of the guys from the third platoon, who was billeted right next to this place, went on leave. So I slept in his bunk instead of having to ride the bike all the way. Well, you know, someone had to squeal right away. So Nye says, I want a morning report in the morning, Galbraith. So I couldn't sleep with a third platoon. I says, yes, sir. So when they woke, the guard woke me up in the morning, I went back to sleep. I went and ate breakfast, went to muster. This is out an hour later at least. And uh, Kylie come to me and says, Galbraith, we're Lieutenant Nye. I says, I suppose he's asleep, sir. He says, does he have you waking him up for Reveille every morning? I says, yes, sir, ordinarily. But he won the morning report, sir. Had to stand muster to get it. I knew I had him by the balls when he said that, but I wasn't about to say anything to anybody. <laughs> so he says, go get a jeep and go get him. Would you believe he was still asleep? Waiting for you to wake him up? Yeah. You, one man absent, the lieutenant, sir. <laughs> yeah, I think he was later than I was. Now, earlier you, you were telling a story um, about when you encountered uh, the German soldiers and you would challenge them and, and uh, they didn't respond and, and they hit the ground. When, when was that? How soon after you had jumped in, into Normandy was that? I would say it was about the th th second night. Okay. Yeah, second night. So you guys took, uh, the, you took them prisoner? Well, the one so that did come one? in. Yeah, but I didn't because, he, you know. Right, you were still. Yeah, so, uh, somebody, the, the lieutenant that told me to let him in, uh, brought him in, you know. But the... Uh, <clears throat> The rest of them that I'd opened up on, uh, I seen a couple of them moving a different way, far from there, the following, after it got daylight. And I asked Hove to go out and see how many we got, and he said, you want to know, you go. <laughs> there was a 40 millimeter right across the field from us, looking right down our throat, so you didn't go anywhere in the open if you could avoid it. Now, did you guys take any other uh, enemy prisoners during your time in Normandy? Well, what really got me is after we left that position that I was in, heading back to, uh, to the bridges, we come across all these wounded Germans. And uh, I mean, there was one hell of a bunch of them. And they were just blown to doll rags. And <clears throat> I said, my God, what the hell happened? They were all prisoners, and they were marching them down the damn road in the column of threes. And the damn Germans opened up on them with their own 88s. Now, they obviously had to know that they were their, their own men. But I guess for surrendering, they went ahead and blew them all to hell anyway. So that was, uh, that was some, and I, we, I got to the, we got to the bridges just as everybody was moving out. Pretty ruthless. Yeah. Had no, we had no, no medication to give them or nothing. You know, only thing we had was that one little thing for the case we got wounded. A morphine. Everybody had a little more 
Then a more film case I got wounded. Nobody abused it. <laughs> Only used it if you had to. Huh? You bet. You just, if you needed it, you sure needed it. Now, were there? Did you guys ever run out of supplies? Were you guys pretty well supplied with ammo? And oh, we had. Uh, we had the equipment bundles when you could find them, mm -hmm. and I would get to them. Sometimes they were so well covered you couldn't get to them. You went up dying, you know, because they were all in, ended up in the open, and the Germans would have them covered pretty well, knowing that that's where you had to go, you know. But uh, as far as uh, what were they, people were able to keep when they jumped was damn little, you know, because the leg packs all tore loose. And it was really a shame because we had never used that leg pack in training. We had never lost anything in the training before. All the time we were in uh, North Carolina and all that stuff in our jumps and stuff, we never lost a damn thing, unless we lost it on purpose. We, we lose our gas masks on purpose and stuff like that every once in a while. They tore off. Or <laughs> but anyway, but we, we didn't lose anything on purpose until it, well, we, unless we wanted to, but normally with them damn leg packs, we, we just, they were gone. And you know, you, you couldn't go back in the, in the dark and try to find them. And that was another thing, we trained, you were supposed to assemble on a blue light and a bugle. I never heard any, seen any blue light or heard any bugle. So as far as assembling, assembling on it, it was impossible. You just got together with whoever you found. Well, we, yeah, yeah, we just joined whoever you see. And then it was with the crickets and stuff like that to know that you're not joining Germans instead of Americans, you know. And when you were uh, told to search for Germans who had infiltrated uh, you know, your company using uh, American uniforms. Yeah. Did you end up finding any? No. No, but we found out later that they had taken Jack's uniform. And I was just wondering, you know, can you imagine Jim and I finding some damn kraut in Jack's uniform? But uh, uh, Joe Bradley, they took his uniform when he was captured, and the German was killed. So they buried the German in Joe Briley's place. So Joe Briley was, you know, uh, reported killed in combat. Mm -hmm. And it was weeks later, after he'd been captured, that they found out that he wasn't killed, that he was a prisoner of the Germans. Quite, quite the story. So there. here he was buried, he's still buried in that cemetery, I think. I don't know if they dug it up again or not, what the hell they did about it, but that's... And when he finally did get to, to uh, uh, Moscow, they uh, didn't want to believe that he was an American. They thought he was a spy because he didn't have any dog tags and, you know. He had been reported killed already. Yeah. So they had take his blood test and everything else before they believe who he was. Talk to me about the last last few days you spent in, in Normandy before you guys pulled out. Oh, there was one one really bad. <clears throat> me and Jerry O'Christie without uh, scrounging, which you really weren't supposed to do, but everybody did. And we came, we were in a, found a whole bunker, bunker full of German potato master grenades. And so <clears throat> we're having a real little 4th of July for ourselves, unscrewing the cap, I mean, unscrewing the charge and throwing it away, and then pulling the string and throwing the stick and the, and the detonator in a, in a foxhole, you know, bang, you know. 
one right after another, having a real little ball. And this guy come up and he says, I want one of them. He says, hell, there's a cases of them in there. And so he no more than walked away and there's an explosion. And we look back and here's this guy with no hands. I don't know whether he had pulled the string and then started to screw it or what the hell he did, but he blew both hands off and was almost blind. He was blind temporarily. And we <coughs> had to load him on a Jeep. And we had one hell of a job finding a Jeep to load him on, you know, to load him on the hood of a Jeep. And then we had a hell of a time finding the medics because there was no real place set up for him. We were back by Cherbourg, you know, at that time. And, and then we didn't have anything set up for anybody being wounded. Nobody expected it, you know. So we had a hell of a time finding some somebody to take care of him, you know. But we finally got to somebody, you know. But that, that, was, that was a case of someone going home with no hands or nothing that was absolutely avoidable. That was really a silly thing. Now, I don't think it was a booby trap. I just think he'd be stupid. He screwed up. So we're talking about the last few days he spent in Normandy, and um, you mentioned that you were out scrounging. Is that something you guys had to do pretty regularly? No. No, well, actually, you really shouldn't have been, because it's a good way to run into booby traps and get hurt and stuff, you know. But we were more or less uh, breaking the rules. I understand you guys were only equipped with about three days of, of rations when you jumped in. Yeah, we all expected to, us to be there by three days and they were going to be relieved or something, but it didn't happen. So uh, they started dropping us supplies. And the best supply we ever got was uh, the five-in-ones. That was the very end. And we were on a MLR. And that MLR was an experience. That's the main line of resistance. And when the 83rd relieved us, they, we told them it was real quiet, not much going on. So they marched down the road in a column of threes. The Germans brought everything they could find to shoot. They were skipping 88s in front of us off the ground at such close range they weren't going off when they hit. They were skipping up and going off behind us, <clears throat> blowing shit out of everything. And one of the things was happening, Nye had asked me to make a, a range card because the 83rd was coming in. And I says, why the hell, why, why should I make a range card? They're coming in the daylight, let them make their own range card. And Nye, I said, I want to. There'd be a range card. So I, I, pay, I draw pretty good, and I drew a scenic dis thing out. And nice guy, idea, final far, too damn gar far anyway, and all kinds of shit all over this thing, you know. And he come, the first time he got out of his damn hole to come up and chew me out about that, you know. And Jim Brown and I are laughing like hell about it. <clears throat> and then... This voice says, that would be enough of that, Galbraith. And there's Kylie and the re captain that was relieving us and the battalion executive officer. Uh, I can't, re can't remember his name right now. Was there, right behind me, you know. And just about then, all the 88s the started coming in. And everybody was trying to dive in our foxhole. We, we had dug a hotel there. And... <laughs> Yeah, they, they were coming off and going on the, off in the, you know, in the trees behind us. So I don't know of anybody that was hit. So just as we're leaving, Lieutenant Knight tells me to take the guy out and show him where the outpost was, which was about 500 yards out in front of us, and where the listening post was afterwards. 
And right in front of Nye, right, well, you know what, to the, the lieutenant he's telling this to, I says there was no <coughs> outpost made, list, no listing, there was no listing post made because we knew damn well Nye would, wouldn't be out there after dark and it was three feet under water. <laughs> so then, then I went out there and not even got, didn't even get shot at. No. <laughs> Nothing really happened. He, nine, nine never tried to get even with me. So did you got? Did you have any uh, relief in that uh, that month long? Um, span being in Normandy, or were you in constant combat on the, on the daily? Oh, no, no. <clears throat> Actually, it was uh, the MLR, that's why I say it was really quiet. <clears throat> in fact, uh, <clears throat> damn it. <clears throat> <clears throat> we had just a couple of uh, smoke shells come in and some mortar fire, but uh, very little, very little contact at all. In fact, the worst, the worst contact we were in was at Bloody Gully. That was the worst firefight we, we were in. And how long did that last for? Just part of a day. So when did you finally get out of, out of Normandy? Oh, I don't know. It was kind of an experience, too. We were right by, we went out on LSTs. And we're walking down the road, <coughs> and on the, the, the people coming the other way, <coughs> Chuck Abeda had been thrown in a guardhouse, and he didn't jump in Normandy. And he was coming in with that other unit. We met him. Hi, Chuck. Well, it seems like an impossible thing to happen, you know. But we have, have no idea what ever happened to him. And they're coming in all clean. They were coming in and we were going out. Okay. But they're all, all uh, replacement troops. Yeah, well, they, they were just coming in to Normandy. Right. Yeah. And you guys are leaving after being... They were leaving. I don't know what outfit they had him in because he had taken a sock at an officer and got thrown in the guardhouse. Mm -hmm. So he didn't come in with us. You guys must have been a, a pr pretty raggedy bunch of guys walking Well, we must have looked like hell. We did get to clean up when we were down by Cherbourg, though. Okay. Yeah. Is that the, I don't think we wore the uniforms or anything like that, but it did get to take a shower and stuff. Was that the first shower you had had since you had yeah. jumped in? Before that, they were all taken in your helmet. We used that pot for everything. I don't see why the army ever got rid of it. I knew new helmet you can't do that with. Multi-purpose, huh? So you eventually returned back to England. Yeah. Yeah, there was, when we returned to England, there were, uh, for the first muster in England, there was 27 enlisted men and four officers. Left. Out of how many? I think about a hundred and I don't know what the whole company's got in it, about 126, I think. So there's only about 30 left. 34 America. counting officers. And what did you do? No, th wait a minute. So it's 27 enlisted men and four officers, that'd be uh, 30, 31. 31. Yeah. And what did you do when you returned to England? <laughs> did you get to rest up a little bit? Oh, well, we got, it was tough and everything like that, sure. And uh, so, but we never got, I never, see, we, when we were in England before, I mean, in England before we left, we were in a barracks by the Bell Inn. There's a story in that, too. But uh, we were billeted in town in a stable, just my, second platoon and <clears throat> so one night somebody stole our honey bucket 
and dumped it in front of the Bell Inn and then threw a smoke grenade in the window. This is right after they went to bed. And the poor boy would come out and he's stomping and all this in his bare feet, I think. And uh, for some reason they thought about that I had something to do with it or something, me and my friends. So me and, my, me and Jim Brown and Madonna had to clean it up. So that's why I know so much about it is we had to clean it up. But we had, know how it got there. We have no idea. We, we didn't put it there. But that's how I know what time it was and the whole shot, you know, they'd already went to bed, it was dark. There's more, there's lots of stories come out on different outfits and stuff, but that's the straight story on it. People playing jokes and pranks on, on other people. Yeah. You know what a honey bucket is. Sure, yeah. 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 <laughs> Not something you want to be stomping around Yeah. With. Not a job you'd want either. I wouldn't want the job of emptying the damn thing. So did you guys return to do more training before you jumped in uh, to Holland? Or what? Well, I went into S3, though. See, so I, did, I was in a few training things. In fact, one was just pretty disastrous. We are on a, a training thing, uh, and... Somebody had picked up a, a dud and was cleaning the mud off of it on his boot. And it, it, it went off and blew his legs off and killed the guy next to him. And that was just uh, another one of those accidents that didn't have to happen. Everybody always told me, do not f fool with, with duds, you know. But this jackass was gonna thought it was gonna be a souvenir or something, I guess. Was it a mine? No, a, a, a shell case, a shell. You know, shell that then went off. Uh -huh. That was in England. Yeah. So along with that guy that blew his hands off, and these two guys that got killed, it was not necessary. Then you see all that stuff in combat, you get used to it, but you don't get used to somebody unnecessarily killing. So. And then eventually, um, you guys are preparing to jump into Holland for Operation Market Garden, correct? Yeah, yeah. So talk to me about the, the days leading up to that mission. Well, I, like I say, I was in S3, so well, I was making out. What does that mean? The, uh, S3 makes out all the training and all that kind of stuff. And we were making sand tables for where we were going. So we were, there was three different times before we actually jumped in Holland that we were making sand tables and everything for where we were going. And the first one we never even got far enough to start making the sand tables was at a, in France at an ammunition dump. And they canceled that. <clears throat> the next one was in Leeds, Belgium. And we did have to make, you know, sand tables for where they expected to jump in Leeds. And they canceled that. <clears throat> and then, <coughs> damn it! Then the next one was in, uh, darn it, there's this place in England and another one in France, I can't, I really can't remember. But we made another one, we had to make all the sand tables on it before we, then, then finally we had to make it for Zahn. Now is this because the army's pushing along so quickly? Yeah, Patton was, was going so fast and taking these places before we could jump. Yeah. You guys were preparing to make other combat jumps. Right. But by the time... Yeah, they, they were catching up on it. Yeah. Right yeah. Gosh. So then eventually... Well, eventually we made out the one for Zahn, which was the final one. Mm -hmm. Zahn was about five miles north of Eindhoven, mm -hmm. I think. I mean, you know, it was in kilometers, so I have no idea. <laughs> 
You're actually constructing these sand tables? Yeah, she made sand tables uh, identical to where, where you were going so that when you jumped, you knew just where you were and everything. What are you basing this off of? Uh, aerial photographs? Yes, yeah. okay. and maps, maps. So we made it, uh, I forget per inch what it was, you know, but, but we made them exactly what, uh, you know, compared to what, where they were going to land. In fact, the, really the Normandy was much, much more complicated than the ones we made for Holland, you know. So was it sort of the, the same preparation for Holland as it was for Normandy? You're, you're in full pack, you're, you're putting... The well, I didn't make there. sand tables for, for Normandy because no, I, I wasn't in that. But when you're making, I mean, you jumped into Holland. Yeah. We, you were still had your, you're still in the machine gun. Oh, no, no, hell. When I went, when, when you were in S3, you, you, all you carried was a, I, like I carried an M1. Okay. Yeah. And how much weight are you carrying on you in, into Holland? Damn little, just an M1. So a lot less. Yeah. So talk to me about that. Again. And uh, I guess art material, stuff to make uh, overlays and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. So take me through your experience of jumping in into Holland. A very, I was, like I say, it was a pretty hard jump. I mean, uh, there was, a, <clears throat> like I say, one or two planes. There was one thing that was absolutely no one else seen, I don't think, but me. One of the C-47s that was coming in burning, the crew was jumping from the right side. There's no doors on the right side of a C-47. So there must have been an opening on the right side you know, so they could jump from there before without getting clear back to the door. And they were, I, I, I could see them going out the far side, you know, and coming down. A couple of them jumped in time, uh, and a couple of them didn't. It was just the crew, uh, none of the paratroops or anything like that that was jumping out of, of the right side. And I have never talked to anybody and I've tried to, this, there was a jump there, that, but no one, I haven't talked to anybody who's seen the right side of that C-47. C I only seen the side that I could see, but they were jumping out the right-hand side. That was the oddest thing I've seen in combat, period. And it was burning, it was on fire. mentioned in Normandy that you know the amount of fire that you witnessed um, you know you said there were tracers everywhere was that not the same experience coming into to Holland? Well obviously there was some f fire but it was daylight too yeah. and so it, made, it wasn't as spectacular in, in the daylight as it was at, at night obviously and uh, there was German German fire or there was not wise there wasn't been C-47 shot down, but nowhere near as many. To us, it was a parade yard jump compared to Normandy. You know, uh, I uh, checked on I Company, and I Company hadn't lost a man on that jump. And you were in HQ Company? At this I was point? in Headquarters Company. Okay. And what was your objective going into Holland? The bridges, uh, we were originally, we, 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 we take the uh, bridge on the Wilhelmina Canal. That was our first objective. But unfortunately, they blew it before we could ever get to it. And so that complicated that a little. But uh, then we had, of course, I got hit on the second day, so I had n nothing to do with uh, keeping the highway open all the way to in Nijmegen, and that, which was the, the 101st job was to open the highway all the way to Nijmegen for the British. 
If it had been patent, they wouldn't have had that problem. Believe it or not, this is, this is a God's, this is, they stopped for it at 10 and 2 for T. I don't give a good damn what they were doing. I said, we're in the middle of battle, them assholes that stopped for T. They, they did that in Ramsbury when the town was on fire. One of my friends was on a on a bucket line, and the bucket stopped coming. Another one was on the end of a hose, and the, the water stopped coming. They were, they were having tea. The town's burning. They got about f grass roots. I mean, flat. You know. And if the fire truck hadn't come down from the airport, I don't know what, maybe the town would have burned down. My wife wouldn't believe that. The damn truth. Even the, the Dutch were amused at how often the damn British stopped for tea. It's crazy to think. While their people are dying up there in Arnhem, they're stopping for tea. You said you were wounded on the, your second day in Holland? Yeah. And where did that happen exactly? Oh, about uh, 100 yards uh, south of the, ch uh, uh, north of the church, is that north of the, south of the church. Yeah, because I know, uh, Zahn was north of Eindhoven, so it would be south of the, of the church, about 100 yards. I tried to get in the door of the church to get to the uh, sniper, and I was trying to knock the door in. It opens out. <laughs> yeah, excitement, I guess, you know. Now you have a, um, is it a bullet fragment on your wall? Yeah. Here? That's what they cut out of the tower up there where, where I shot the sniper. And that? fragment hit your, your captain? Oh, hell no, the sniper killed the captain. I shot up there in the bell tower. Okay, so that fragment is... And that was dug out of the bricks up in the okay. bell tower. Got it, got it. I misunderstood when you yeah. said it earlier. So um, can you explain to me that story? How that all happened? Your, your captain had gotten... Well, we, my, my uh, Kylie was sta standing... Uh, behind a burned out truck. First, first he told me to go back uh, and get a hold of Jim Brown, who had a 537 radio, and tell H Company to get the hell up online or we'd get flanked. So I got back to Jim and I said, tell H Company that Major Horton, I hadn't seen Major Horton, said to get the hell up online that they're not receiving that much fire. So Jim did just that, just like I had talked to Horton on the whole shot. And a bullet hit him. He had it right by his face like this. And a bullet hit it and tore it clear out of his hand. And Jim just looked down at the damn radio and said, I guess that's no good anymore, and walked away and left it. <laughs> so then I got back to Nye, I mean back to uh, Kylie, and I says, taken care of, and uh, then I says, uh, you better get down to, I didn't, I didn't think I said sir, but I said, you better get down, you're gonna get your ass shot. He says, I get down, so will everybody else, and the bullet hit him in the throat. And I knew it was from that bell tower. And so I, put, I couldn't see nobody in the bell tower, he wasn't standing so you could see him. But I put about four or five rounds up there, and he never shot anybody else. Uh, Ian Gardner's got some other theory where the sniper was and everything else, but he couldn't have possibly been anywhere except that bell tower to hit Kylie in the throat. And the uh, sacrifice of the church told me there was one German up there and he was dead. But the priest told, uh, Ian, 
there was no one in the bell tower. But the priest was in the basement, so the priest wouldn't have known whether there was anybody in the damn bell that could have been a platoon up there, and he wouldn't have known it. And the sacristan told me there was one German there that was dead, so I don't know who the hell to believe, you know. But anyway, he never shot anybody else. And that bullet fragment was from what you had shot up into the... That, that was my bullet dug out of the bricks. It was an armor piercing, so it went a little ways in the bed. And was that was that day one that that had happened? Second. Second day. So Second shortly day. Shortly before you had you had been wounded. Well, after. That was after you had been wounded. Well, no, we didn't dig this out until five, ten or twelve years later. No, I, but I mean, that incident where your captain had been killed. Had you already been been wounded at that? No, time? no, I. After that, I tried to get in the church, and, you know, but I, I thought the door opened in for some reason, and I couldn't get in. I went up the street, and a German a machine gun opened up on me, and I stepped into a brick doorway, figuring he could wear the damn thing out, you know, and he couldn't hit me. And then a 88 hit across the street. Of course, but I didn't know what it was, but it was a hell of an explosion across the street. And <clears throat> Copperstone, who disappeared in Normandy without fighting with us or anything, was standing right alongside that how, uh, that building. <clears throat> Blew the whole front of it out and didn't harm him at all. That wall was the way it stood, you know. That was a brick. And <clears throat> I said, that was pretty close, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, damn close, he says. And from what I understand, no one seen him after that. So he took off again and hollered. I have no idea that part. I can't add. But anyway, <clears throat> then uh, <clears throat> the next one hit and hit me. And of course, I blew me into the street. And so I was, I was really worried about that damn machine gun. You know, and I think the Germans are pretty soft-hearted when it comes to people wounded, because they could have shot me when I hit the, was out outside, you know, again. But I tried to get back into the doorway, <clears throat> and then the next one come in and hit me in the shoulder. So I decided that wasn't a very damn safe place to stay. So I had my rifle in my right hand, couldn't move move this hand at all, and I had to push myself down the street with my only good foot, and the glass was piling up behind me. I don't know how come I didn't get cut, but I didn't. I went whole, one whole house to the next one. They were all, you know, uh, you know, they were all connected. But I went from one doorway to the next doorway, and uh, Pete Klopmacher reached out, opened the door, and pulled me inside. And he knew more and pulled me inside, and Bill Kidder got to me, the medic, and uh, took one look at my leg and said, you're out of this war. <laughs> so then Jim Brown and, and Madonna both got to me, and I give Madonna the 45 I'd got off Lieutenant Christmas in Normandy. And so I guess I stayed with him until he got hit in Bastogne. But uh, then they took me out of the house, that house, put me on, a, on the back of a jeep, and hauled me down to Zahn, and put me in a tent. And that was about the time when the damn Germans counterattacked again. And the bullets were all coming through the top of the damn tent, you know, I'm on a litter, you know. Thinking, hell, I ain't going to get out of this war, it looked like. And then they took me, two, two prisoners picked me up, took me and pushed me underneath a bed in, in the sanitarium that we had taken over, you know, for the wounded. And uh, <clears throat> so a priest, well, a priest come and found me, 
and asked me if I was looking for my dog tags, and I'd had them in my damn pocket. I never could stand anything around my damn neck. And after normally, you'd think I'd known better than that, but I didn't. I, you know, I put them in my pocket. So then when they cut my pants off and everything, of course, the dog bags were gone. I was probably unconscious or something when that all happened, you know. So he asked me if I was Catholic, and I says yes. And so he brought me a rosary and hung it around my neck, one of those big rosaries. And couldn't find the proper cross for it, but it was a little, little, small crucifix he had on the end of it. Said he apologized, as that's the only crucifix you know they could find for it. He says, "I keep that, you know, because he didn't want me to die or something and not know I was a Catholic." So they, they loaded us. Finally, they loaded us on a British ambulance. They're big square jobs, you know, and. <clears throat> We're going out and, and we finally stopped because it's doing, we thought it was a firefight, so damn much ammunition flying, you know? And finally, some, the, the uh, driver come out, opened the back door and says, relax, we're just <coughs> waiting for that ammunition truck to blow up. They, they you know, hit one and, and all the ammunition was burning off and everything. And so as soon as it exploded and everything, we went on by it, you know. And But when I got to Brussels, I had that rosemary on my neck, right? You'd have thought I was a pope. Man, I really got the attention because they're all Catholics in Belgium, you know. And uh, now the gal takes and throws the blanket off of me, and naked as a jaybird, of course and starts washing me, picked me up and washed my back and kissed me and walked away. <laughs> and then eventually they put me on a C-47 and flew me to England. And I'm no more in England, maybe, you know, a day or two. And they operated on my shoulder and I could move my arm again. I don't know why I couldn't move it before that. It must have been on a nerve or some damn thing that I, I absolutely couldn't move it, you know, before they, before they took the shrapnel out of it. I found out later they didn't even get all the shrapnel still in there. But uh, we've seen that later on x-rays and stuff. But uh, as soon as they operated on it, I could move it again. I didn't, you know, have to have therapy or anything like that. Coming back on the boat, it was kind of comical. The, everything stinks like hell, you know, when you were in those wards. And all the wounds were draining and smelled terrible. So everybody's got their por porthole open. And I guess go down by the Azores, we got, we got into pretty rough sea, and it come in the porthole, I mean, really a, a lot of water. Wards the guy down companion way, clear out of his bunk. But it, it damn near drowned me and the guy underneath me. And the very next night, the, the, the nurse had given me a duck, you know what that is, a urinal. And I fell asleep and that fell over and poured all over the guy underneath me, so I wasn't very proud. <laughs> but we got milk on that boat. We couldn't get over that on that, you know, on the hospital ship. We got milk. You'd think grown men milk wouldn't be that thing, you know. But God, we hadn't had a drink of milk the whole time we were overseas until until we got on that hospital ship. And we come into Charleston. So how long were you in the hospital overseas before you, you got on the ship to come back home? I don't. Well, I was back home before Christmas, and I was hit in September. So, uh, you know, just, uh, I, I was back in, in, in uh, uh, I'm thinking of the hospital in, in Modesto, but I was back in Modesto between, uh, before, before Christmas. Both my mother and my dad both come to visit me in, in uh, the hospital at Christmas. And then 
I was in that, that hospital. <clears throat> I had osteo in my leg. That's a, a, a bone infection. And Bill Colebrook come to visit me. He's got his arm in a, in a airplane cast with a brace underneath like this. And I didn't know him, but he had heard of me through Jim Brown and stuff when he, 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 he had been in I Company. And so when he found out I was in that hospital, he come to visit me. And <clears throat> when it's time to go, the nurse says, you'll have to leave. She said, it's uh, visiting hours are over. She says, I'm not leaving. You're putting me in the bed across from me. You're putting me in that bed. And by God, they had him. They put him in the bed next to me. And it ended up being a real blessing because he ended up carrying my leg all over the hospital. There wasn't enough wheelchairs. And there was only one wheelchair in the ward and somebody else had those little wicker ones in those days. And <clears throat> a guy by the name of Files had that. And I'd put my leg in that brace underneath Bill's arm and follow him all over the hospital on crutches. He'd pretty damn on him. He'd take off running. And I'd have to keep up on the damn crutches. Dead run across the damn place. Him had a dead run with my leg and underneath his arm, trying to keep up. And people almost had a fit. Must have been a sight to see. Yeah, it must have been, really. Well, I imagine it was pretty painful when you'd, you'd gotten hit. Um, and you mentioned that you guys had your, your morphine with you. Yeah. Was that enough to... To take the pain you know, I don't think I even used it. I don't. I, I, I was in so damn much pain. I didn't even think of it. I don't think. And I, I was, I was so damn worried about that German machine gun. But uh, evidently, uh, they, the Germans know it takes two men to take care of every one that's shot. So usually, the wounded they they, they don't shoot because they know it's going to take more people taking care of me than... So anyway, the, whoever it was, we were uh, fighting there, you know. Uh, didn't, didn't shoot me anyway. At any point, did you think you weren't gonna make it back home? Well, <laughs> I sure thought so when we went by that burning truck, but it didn't have nothing to do with it. And, uh, we had some of the, even the V2s coming in near, in the hospital in England. And I mean, that really shakes, when those V2s hit, it really shakes the shit out of everything, you know. So we were kind of worried about that, but I don't know if anybody was ever hurt, you know, at the hospital or anything from that. And then once you uh, made it back to the States, you spent more time in the hospital recovering? Well, you got an infection and well, I got, uh, like I say, committed to Charleston. Mm -hmm. They changed the cast on my leg and everything and that. Put me on a C-54 and sent me to, to uh, Modesto, you said? Modesto. Uh, and uh, I used to remember the name of that damn hospital, but I can't remember it now. But the next one, they, they took me out of that hospital and put me in Dibble up in Menlo Park. And uh, that was some really experiences there. The hospital experience was more than the combat almost. We had a blind guy named Joe Tostel. And he, he had been hit in, in uh, Belgium. But he had been an artillery outfit. And anyway, he, he lost his eyes. And he was God a character. And he usually never went with me because I was on crutches. He usually went with somebody who could just touch him with his hand and follow him all over the place and not even look like he was blind, you know. But he went with me this time and went in this hotel down by San Jose. I mean, a restaurant, real fancy restaurant. And uh, so we had lunch, dinner, whatever it was. And uh, was sitting at the bar drinking afterwards. Of course, uh, we didn't. Uh, we weren't married. We were always looking for girls, you know. 
And so we're drinking, and I said, well, don't there ain't a damn soul in this place. Let's go across the street and see if there's any life over there. And Joe says, okay. He takes out one of his eyes and puts it next to his drink, which he hadn't finished drinking. He says, keep an eye on that. And we left that eye next to the drink. And we went across the street. And some girl tried to pick me up the minute I walked in the damn door. And I had a hell of a time telling Joe I didn't want to go with her. And so finally we ended up, there was nobody over there either that I was interested in. So we get ready to leave. Joe says, my God, woman, what's in this glass? And of course she looks in the glass and there's his other eye. Of course, he's got the dark glasses on. He can take them off. When he took them off, no one could tell him. You know, they are taking them off, taking them out, you know. <laughs> and she damn near faints, digs his eye out, puts it back. And we went back. <clears throat> and uh, no more than sat down and, and Joe touched his glass. He knew right where his eye was. Saying, Thanks for keeping an eye on that for me. But the bartender's used to us from the hospital a little bit because it wasn't the first time we'd all been in there, you know. And he said, you see that guy over there? We said, I says, yeah. He said, he ordered a drink and he looked, seen that eye on the bar and he still hadn't drank it. <laughs> so anyway, we closed that damn place about two o'clock in the morning. And we took a cab back to the hospital. So we get out of the cab and we got about three steps to walk up uh, towards one of the temporary buildings, you know. And so he's got a hold of my belt in the back. And we go up the three steps, go in the door and get down the hall. He decides we should run. So he's dead blind and I'm on crutches and he's pushing me through that hospital at two o'clock in the morning in a dead run. You can imagine the noise it made. So we get into the damn morgue, and uh, Ruby, one of the nurses we had, was taking my boots off and putting me to bed. Joe pulls off his pants and chains went all over the damn floor, and he'd leave her for the sweeper. <laughs> he got, goes to sleep by himself, you know. And of course, it's, you know, it's never dark enough in the hospital ward. So anyway, it wasn't like it was in the dark or anything, but the next morning, Hubble come over and give him a drink. And uh, he says, what the hell, what's in this drink? He says, uh, cream. And uh, Joe says, cream hell, it's not cream. It's cream of Kentucky, oh, that's different. So he went ahead and drank it, you know. But he was really, really a character, I swear. My wife went to visit him. I used to go up and visit him up where I lived there, yeah, right south, just north of Portland. Most of the time I can say the name of the place, but right now I can't. But anyway, it's just barely north of Portland. And uh, anyway, we drove down from, from uh, Washington, you know, uh, big town in Washington, what the hell is it? Seattle? Seattle. Mm -hmm. Drove down from Seattle to his place, and <clears throat> we pulled up, called, of course, and told him we were coming. So we pulled up in front of his house. he come out. Of, my, my wife didn't particularly think, she didn't think she wanted to meet a blind man, you know. But anyway, we pulled up in front of his house, he come out of the house and walk right straight to Anna's door and, and, you know, inviting her in. She couldn't believe it. You know, here he is, dead blind and everything, and he walks right to her door. And I introduced him and everything, and he brings her in the house and tells her how he just got through painting the place and stuff. Oh, you didn't? He said, yes, I did. My sister helped me. Anyway, he had, he had painted, the, the, you know, the living room anyway. 
And he almost she almost had to show Annie his braille machine before he'd, she'd believe he was blind. On it, he was showing her see these pictures and telling every telling her who everybody was in the pictures and stuff. And then he picture like that picture on the wall there, but it was Rainier with a lake in front of it. See that mountain with a lake in front of it and everything. Man was had a hell of a time believing he was really blind, you know. He didn't let it slow him down, huh? huh? He didn't let it slow him down. Not a bit, boy. I'm telling you, that guy was something else. One time, Hubble was with him, and he walked out. It was supposed to be a special trip for, for the blind. And he gets to the bus, and he's got the white cane and everything, you know. But anyway, the way he walks right straight to it and everything, and they said, I'm sorry, this is just for the blind. He says, I thought I'd kind of like to go. And she turned to Hubble and she said, there's something wrong with his eyes. Hubble says they're pretty good for plastic. <laughs> he was psychic too. He walked down the hall, we got to McCormick down here in Pasadena on the sixth floor. And the, the uh, elevators was in an alcove off the, the hall, you know. You had to go in, you could go either right or left. And if the damn door was open, he'd go in that alcove and walk right in like he could see, you know. And I mean, boy, I'm telling you, he was, he was really, and he was one of the few that didn't paw the nurses with the excuse that he wanted to know what they felt like, you know, mm -hmm. what they looked like. He really was exceptional. So were you following along uh, with the war and how it was progressing once you had returned home, or had you kind of put that on? Oh, uh, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> when I was in Hammond, Mom and Pop Brown had been visiting me because they knew, found out that I was there, and their son told me, told them I was where I was and everything. And they were visiting from me from uh, Richmond. They lived in Richmond, that's up just above Oakland and uh, <clears throat> bringing us boxes of candy and distributing it in the war and all this kind of stuff. And finally they come to tell me that Jim had got it. Well, he got it in Bastogne, which was a really heartbreaking thing. To... But I, well, I have an album and I'll show you. And uh, I got that from the Browns. I never took one, no, I didn't take, any of the front pictures of that of when we were to go on my, and uh, you know, Ben and stuff. Uh, you know, I didn't take any of those pictures. I got some afterwards, you know, I was talking stuff. But, but that was after, you know, way after. But the Browns had given me all those pictures that they, take, that they had uh, took and had to tell me that Jim had got it, you know. And here Jack was captured. So while I was at uh, Divolo, Jack got back from the service, and I have a picture in the album of when the uh, Pop Brown ran two of Kaiser's yards for Liberty ships. They used to put a Liberty ship out a week. I know, I guess that was between the two yards or something, but anyway, I, I was at the, me and Jack was invited to the uh, christening of the San Mateo mm -hmm. Liberty ship. Well, I got pictures of that. Do you remember when you got word that the war had ended in Europe? Do you remember where you were? Oh, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, uh, I think we were divo by that time, you know. And just like I was still in the hospital when they started all these other damn wars in Korea and everything, you know. But uh, I was thinking while those poor buggers and Bastogne were freezing their ass off, I was flirting with nurses. <laughs> we used to have one nurse. That, the nurses weren't supposed to go with the listed men, you know. They were officers. And uh, so anyway, John Kelly 
friend of mine. He was in the, happened to be in the 504, though, in the 82nd. But we were in the hospital together. And he, he was from, from Denver. And uh, he was married. And uh, so we had this nurse named Agnes Kelly. And we, we, we had nicknamed her Taffy because her hair was taffy colored, you know. And I think she liked that a damn sight better than Agnes. So we used to go all the time, and anybody, MPs or anything, say anything to her, so I, I can go with my brother, can I? And that's so they couldn't say shit, you know. So that was a convenience that worked out pretty good. So as long as the three of us together, we did really great. <laughs> But she was a very, very attractive nurse. And you, you mentioned that you had met your wife uh, while you were overseas. Yeah, I met her right after Normandy at a dance in Eindhoven. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Edinburgh. Edinburgh, <laughs> Edinburgh yeah. And uh, while we first went in there, I would leave my jump jacket with her Every time I went to the to the toilet, so I went, didn't want her to leave or something. So I knew she wouldn't leave as long as she had my jump jacket. And so I, they every time you go to the toilet, she thought I had the worst kidneys in the world. But there was no drinking in this this dance hall. All the Scots was in the toilet. With the, the, the Scotsmen in there drinking. Here, Yank, have a drink. Every time I go in, Yank, have a drink, you know. So she thought I had pretty bad kidneys, I think. So then she asked me if I wanted to go home with her, and I said, you're damn right, you know. So she was a real cute little thing. Five, four, eleven. Anyway, it's kind of redheaded, but not, not really, but reddish tinge to it. Anyway. I, I got to sleep with her brother, Owen. <laughs> and when her folks come home, she told them that Owen had brought me home. She didn't tell, me, tell them that she had brought me home from the dance in Edinburgh. But anyway, <clears throat> I got ready to leave. Uh, this air Corps guy told me he was sure that I could ride back with them. And we traded jackets. I gave him my jump jacket, and he gave me his leather you know, Air Force jacket. I thought I got the best of the deal, really. But I lost it all. We, we lo everything we left in England was stolen. Every I don't know why they can't, you know, protect anybody's things and stuff. And after Normandy, I had some stuff when we went to Holland that uh, I wish I'd have sent home. Because in Normandy, I found this jump knife, German jump knife, number 506. And that's really a coincidence, you know. So there was a German jump knife number 506. And of course, my leather jacket and all that stuff, everything was stolen. I never got anything we left back in England either after, you know. When we left, when we left in England, we went to Normandy, never got anything back, we never found anything again. And the same thing we got back, you know, when I got hit. My folks would have got a damn thing. It was a shame how much stuff that was stolen like that. And then, uh, when when did your wife eventually make it to the U.S.? Well, uh, she wrote to me the whole time I was in the service, naturally, and uh, I got I was uh, home living with with my mother in Long Beach. And I got to reading letters, and I got to reading stuff in them I hadn't even noticed before, you know. So I wrote a letter and asked her if she married me, and she says yes. So I, my company, the Graham Brothers, put up a $500 bond for her to come over. So I waited quite a while, and finally uh, she got here on Christmas Day, 1948. And we were married on the, three days later in the Catholic Church. So that takes some doing, but they all knew. Of course, they knew she was coming way in advance and everything. 
But when you see these people coming over the border now, you know, all this kind of crap, she had to prove character. She had to have character references. She had to prove her health and all. For a while, she had uh, plur pleurisy, you know, in her lungs that she delayed her until that was cured before she could even come for that, you know. But when she finally got here, I rushed her to immigration, to, you know, because I thought she went ahead came on a temporary visa. Mm -hmm. And they told me, well, you, there was no hurry, she got a permanent visa. <laughs> That's what I've been trying to tell you, you know. And you guys went on to have 10, ten children? 10, yeah. And how long are you married? Three before? girls and seven boys. And how many years of marriage? 68. She passed away in, in, in March, 19, four years ago. Twenty fourteen. Well, if there's any advice that you could offer for my generation or future generations, um, is there anything you could? Well, no advice. I, I I'd say anybody that wishes they were in a war, don't know what they're wishing for, you know? But uh, I'm, I'm very uh, proud of being what I've done and who I was with and all that, you know? And we would do it again in a second, but uh, Probably the only really ex the best and only experience. And not only another field, uh, experience that was worth the whole thing. I was down in San Diego when Oscar was training to, he was actually training to go back to Holland and at Brown Field in, in San Diego. And so when I uh, volunteered to jump at Brown Field with Oscar, he was really, really surprised you know, because of my leg and stuff. And uh, so anyway, that was another one of the best things I, I ever decided to do. And then for some reason, Oscar didn't jump in, on the 15th of Normandy. I don't know why he didn't realize that he could have jumped with us. He could have had his way in Aurora's way paid back there and everything. But anyway, he didn't jump with me in Normandy, but he jumped in Hollywood. But, we jumped to Normandy, or I jumped to Normandy on the 50th, and I jumped in Holland for the end of the war. We went for the jump, you know, the, for anniversary of the jump on the 18th of September, but it was too windy and nobody could jump. So the Dutch paid our way back and everything, they paid our way and everything, our wives and, and I, you know, and there was five of us. They took them took up on that. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, we went back and we jumped for the end of the war in, in Holland and Eindhoven and Schusterberg. I got hurt in Schusterberg and told my wife I wouldn't do it anymore. I would, I would have broken a second because we were up at Arnhem and uh, Jan Kulin come up and he says, can you jump on one leg, Bill? I says, our last nine been on one. I accidentally hit the bad one on the last one in Schusterberg. And, uh, but anyway, it ended up was too windy to jump in when we, when we wanted to jump in Arnhem. Well, I want to thank you very much for sitting down with me and sharing your story. Well, it's been a pleasure. It really has, yeah. And thank you for your service.